you know, Google's vast corpora of texts has, it, I mean, the curve is basically vertical. So how did this happen? Like, where did this idea come from? When did people first take it seriously? Um, and I argue that for basically this idea of human extinction first made its debut uh, among the ancient Greek philosophers, in particular, the pre-Socratic philosophers. Um, and then it basically just disappeared for roughly 1500 years. And that coincides with the rise of Christianity, which became really widespread the, the Roman Empire, fourth, fifth centuries of the Common Era. And then Christianity declined in the uh, 19th century, in particular among the intelligentsia, as it were. Um, and that also just so happens to be when uh, scientists discovered the first credible, widely accepted kill mechanisms. So the, you know, or, or ways that humanity could actually go extinct. So the decline of Christianity opened up conceptual space for people to go, oh, actually human extinction is possible in principle. And then scientists said, oh, actually there's some really bad news. We found out that not only is human extinction possible, but it's it could actually happen. And in fact, the, it was a double trauma because they said not only is it actually possible, but it's inevitable in the long term. And so this was associated with the second law of thermodynamics, which immediately people recognized in the early 1850s implies that Earth will become uninhabitable uh, to human life millions of years in the future, but eventually, and maybe the universe it's, as a whole will become you know, completely uninhabitable. Um, so understanding the contours of this strange evolutionary journey of the idea of human extinction is the aim of part one. And then part two focuses on a related but entirely distinct set of questions, which concern the ethical and evaluative implications of human extinction. Um, and I, it actually took me writing the book in a, an entire draft, which was like 150,000 words, so really long, for me to realize that actually these are two distinct histories because they're, they're really two, they are related in certain obvious and non-obvious ways, um, but they're distinct categories of questions. So could human extinction happen? Is it possible? What's the probability? Is the probability rising or falling? How many kill, mecha um, kill mechanisms are there? And so on. That's one set of questions. Another set of questions is just how bad would human extinction be? You know, would it be wrong to bring about our extinction? Um, do we have obligations to past people who, you know, maybe spent their lifetime contributing to a tradition of thought contributing to the scientific enterprise and so on with the explicit aim uh, with the with the uh, assumption that this enterprise would continue far into the future so do we have obligations to the past people do we have obligations to bring into existence future people you know the, uh, a very influential position within existential ethics which is just the subfield of ethics focused on these sort of ethical and evaluative questions um, a, a very influential position is long-termism, which is very related to total what's called total utilitarianism. Uh, and this claims that we have this sort of moral obligation to maximize the total amount of value that exists in the universe. So from our current position all the way until the heat death of the universe occurs, in which at which point all life <laughs> ceases. Um, but you know, that's an enormous amount of time. Uh, before us. And so on this utilitarian or sort of long-termist view, we have this obligation to ensure that as many happy people come to exist in the future as possible. And so that leads to uh, uh, this assessment of our extinction, according to which uh, the worst aspect of human extinction, uh, if it were to occur this century, for example, uh, or if it were to occur, let's say next week, the worst aspect wouldn't be the 8 billion people who die. That would be very bad. But much worse would be all of this lost value, which, you know, if we spread into space, we exist for a really long time, there could just be an enormous number of people, a, 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 a future population that absolutely dwarfs <laughs> the current human population. So th these are the sorts of questions that uh, are the central questions of part two. You know, and 
you know, p- part two is 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 not just sort of like so. There, there are two aspects of part two. One is, is establishing a theoretical framework for making sense of existential ethics, and then the second task is sort of tracing the uh, development of this field uh, from its origins, which really go back to the early 18th century. I think probably the first philosopher to uh, uh, to gesture at some of the, the central themes of existential ethics was probably Montesquieu in his, his 1721, uh, if I remember correctly, Persian letters, uh, epistolary novel. Um, but then existential ethics really takes off in the latter 19th century. So it's it's a pretty recent field. And in fact, it's sort of shocking a bit that so few philosophers have have seriously engaged in a systematic or sustained manner with the central questions of uh, existential ethics. So that's sort of part two. And I'm more than happy to uh, go into further detail because there's lots of what I consider to be very interesting aspects of existential ethics, as well as lots of surprising details about the history of thinking about human extinction. So I, ho- I hope that's a, that's a good like overview. Uh, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. I have I have one immediate question. Um, is Can you imagine a case in which human beings uh, actually have an ethical obligation to make themselves extinct? It's a good question. Um, so one of the three main positions in existential ethics, it, it, so I'll name the other two just as points of reference. Um, uh, there's what I call further loss views, which argue, so all of this, actually, the, maybe the best thing to do is to first introduce this fundamental distinction between the process or event of going extinct and the state or condition of being extinct. And like, kind of amazingly, no, no philosopher has previously uh, explicitly noted this distinction. So th- that's really important. Uh, further loss theorists, they claim that going extinct may be a source of of extinction's badness, because maybe lots of people suffer, maybe uh, they die prematurely, uh, and all of that is bad. <laughs> but also they point to this subsequent state of non-existence of being extinct as a source of badness as well. So again, it's the opportunity costs of no longer existing, it's all of the lost value, which could be astronomical in quantity. Again, because you know we've existed for this amount of time, 200, 300,000 years, the future of humanity could be, you know, at least 10 to the 40 years. So one followed by 40 zeros, uh, maybe much longer. The heat death won't happen until 10 to the 100 years from now. So it's just a huge number of people <laughs> that you could exist in the future. All of that would be lost. And they would say that also in assessing the badness of human extinction, you have to look at those opportunity costs. Equivalence theorists. So this is the second main position. They would say actually being extinct is just morally irrelevant. And there are different ways of spelling this out, but but maybe the most uh, straightforward way is to say, well, if humanity doesn't exist, if there's nobody around to bemoan or suffer the non-existence of humanity or the non-existence of science and happiness and philosophy and poetry and all of the things that could have existed, if there's nobody around to suffer that loss, then where exactly is the harm? Where is the bad? Can you point to it? Who is made worse off? Since nobody is, uh, then being extinct is just not morally relevant. That being said, they would still point to the process or event of going extinct as a potential source of uh, badness. You know, if 8 billion people die, that's very bad. But they would say, okay, if, if 8 billion people decide not to have children voluntarily without any coercion, then that wouldn't be bad because there's nothing bad or wrong about not having kids. Well, as many would argue. Um, therefore, there's nothing bad or wrong with going extinct in this way. It's just and and there's nothing left to say. So all so having mentioned that, the third view is pro extinctionism, and this I, I think somewhat surprisingly, um, there have been you know probably close to a majority of philosophers who have broached the topic of the ethics of human extinction, who have also held a pro extinctionist view, uh, and so. On the the most popular pro-extinctionist position, going extinct may very well be bad or wrong. 
So there are lots of procrastinationists who would say, omnicide, the murder of everyone, that is absolutely impermissible. <laughs> no one should ever do that. But they'd add that being extinct is better in some sense, better than being extinct, which doesn't mean being extinct is good. I know a pro extinctionist, for example, who says being extinct would be absolutely terrible, but being extant is worse. <laughs> so, you know, we, we, we should try to figure out some voluntary, non-coercive way to bring about our extinction because that would just be a better state of affairs. Um, and there, there are two general ways of motivating this position. Uh, or approaches to, to motivating this position. One is to focus on future human suffering. So if we don't exist, if we instantiate that state or condition of being extinct, then a potentially enormous amount of future human suffering doesn't exist. And that would be good. And some would say, well, there's just there are types of, of human suffering like child abuse or torture or something that there's just no amount of positive experience that could possibly counterbalance that. So if you expect to, there to be torture and child abuse and so on in the future, then it's just better that we no longer exist, even if lots of other people are happy. I hope that makes sense. The other approach is environmentalist. Uh, and there are plenty of environmentalists over the past you know, 70 years who have arrived at a pro-extinctionist view after uh, or because of considerations relating to our profound deleterious impact on the biosphere, which of course is, is undeniable. We're in the, the early stage of the sixth mass extinction event. You know, Living Planet Report found that between 1970 and basically today, the global population of wild vertebrates has declined by 60%. So that's just like a staggering number. That's because of us. And so one good example of this is the Voluntary Human Extinction Movement. Uh, the acronym is V-H-E-M-T, which they pronounce vehement, uh, run by a guy named Les Knight. And so, yeah, it's, as the name suggests, it's voluntary. Um, he advocates that we stop procreating for environmentalist reasons. So he is a pro-extinctionist. And, and beneath all of this is a fundamental moral conviction that going extinct is what we ought to do. <laughs> so yes, you, there absolutely there are people out there who say we should go extinct, but it's just worth uh, emphasizing that you know a lot of pro-extinctionists are absolutely vociferously opposed to any kind of means of going extinct that would be involuntary, violent, cut life short, or cause suffering. I mean, it's certainly fair. That's a very succinct summary of like pretty much pretty much all all I, I ever knew about um, existential philosophy. So thank you for that. Um, Marie has a question. Marie. Thank you. Thank you. It's very interesting. You know, I belong to these people who voluntarily don't have children. And uh, I'm noticing at least in Europe, there is more and more of us. But you know, like... Uh, I decided not to have children, but my brother has three. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I I have, a, and, and he feels he's responsible for our family. <laughs> uh, you know, like, um, do you think human extinction, voluntary human extinction? I, I mean, and that is a question, what is voluntary human extinction? I would actually say, that people voluntarily extinct by, by destroying the environment. And uh, uh, that is actually conscious voluntary uh, as well, right? Uh, do you think uh, voluntary human extinction is possible? Great question. Um, yeah, I don't know. There, there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of pro-extinctionists who Maybe one one thing to make clear right away is uh, this, you know, th there's the, a position called antinatalism, right? And that uh, is the claim that we should not have kids. And so there are antinatalists like David Benatar is probably the most uh, famous contemporary antinatalist um, who arrive at a pro-extinctionist view because of their antinatalism. They say antinatalism is morally wrong. 
And they have various arguments for that. Like maybe one argument is Schopenhauerian. Like, oh, life is just very bad. It's full of suffering. Maybe even a lot more suffering than most of us normally realize. And that's what makes bringing a new person into the world morally wrong. Okay, so if we take antinatalism seriously, we all stop having kids, then humanity will die out eventually over you know 120 years or so. Um, and but but also you could you could flip that around and be a pro-extinctionist and say, like, well, I don't think there's anything morally wrong with having children with that act itself. There's nothing morally wrong with that. But we want to to not exist. And therefore, the pro-extinctionists will uh, endorse antinatalism as a means to this end, right? Does that make sense? And so all of this is to say then that uh, I think most pro-extinctionists, um, most pro-extinctionists have pointed to antinatalism as the only morally permissible way that we could possibly, uh, that going extinct uh, would be, uh, th that we should try to go extinct. <laughs> It's the only more morally permissible way. That being said, most pro-extinctions have also acknowledged that it's totally implausible. <laughs> like David Benatar is explicit. Like people around the world aren't going to read Schopenhauer or his books and go like, okay, I should stop <laughs> having kids. And, you know, that that's just not going to happen. So, yeah, I think that voluntary human extinction is just extremely unlikely. By far the most probable ways that we're going to die out uh, uh, involve catastrophe, either a natural catastrophe, an asteroid striking Earth, super volcano. You know, asteroid, we sort of have some idea of how we might be able to uh, prevent that. Super volcano, we have no idea. Not even science fiction writers have come up with any half plausible way of preventing a volcanic super eruption from just flooding the stratosphere with sulfur aerosols that will block incoming solar radiation. Um, and so, yeah, or of course it could be anthropogenic through a nuclear war, you know, maybe machine superintelligence, something like that. So that is the most probable way that will go extinct. And yeah, voluntary human extinction is just, just not going to happen. So it's, it's sort of an interesting idea for people, for philosophers to, discuss and debate and, and so on but in the but real world what you consider your, uh, voluntary because because if you think of like all these people i live in stuttgart uh, there are streets full of cars everything uh, you know like all these people and these people are having the children they don't feel responsibility towards them uh all, all these people with children actually take their children to school by car, everything, though we have quite good public transport, it's just easier, right? Uh, uh, so actually I can see more than more more and more that uh, that people who have children are less responsible to the environment than than the people who just uh, you know, who just think that I cannot uh, give this future to my child because it's irresponsible. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it, it's a thorny issue. And, and I mean, it's true that like one of the best ways to reduce your carbon footprint is to not have kids. There's like eating, uh, not, you know, becoming a vegetarian or a vegan, you know, will reduce your, uh, your environmental impact by this much. Not having a kid will reduce it by like this much. I'm vegan um, as well. <laughs> yeah, but also actually, so uh, if I understood correctly, it seemed like you you gestured at another really interesting issue, which is what does it mean for human extinction to be voluntary in exactly. the first place? Yeah. Like, like so in the book, I distinguish between um, a, a sort of universalistic understanding of voluntariness and a democratic uh, notion. Um, and so the, the universalistic is, is sort of the obvious that, you know, where every single person on earth agrees, <laughs> you know, that we shouldn't have kids or whatever, and therefore we should go extinct. Democratic is just where there's like, you know, enough people 
to reduce the human population. If that trend were to continue, then you dip below the minimum viable population, which is estimated to be maybe something like 140,000, although it might be as low as 150 people. But once you get to, to that uh, uh, point, then extinction is just guaranteed because there's not enough genetic diversity and, and so on for the human species to, to continue. So like, you know, if, if there's like a large majority of people who decide to not have kids because they want humanity to disappear, but there's this minority that feel, let's say, feel strongly that humanity should continue. And then the majority decision ends up uh, uh, determining our future. Is that voluntary? Like, I don't know. So this notion of voluntariness just, I mean, that that has a straightforward uh, meaning and a straightforward sense with respect to individuals. Like, I know what it is for me to voluntarily decide to do something. But when you're talking about uh, a collective, it's not super clear what voluntary means exactly. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's a sense in which like, um, you, you know, if 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 uh, the voting public were to endorse uh, to vote for something like the legalization of gay marriage, you might say it's voluntary. That decision is voluntary, um, even if there's like, you know, twenty percent of the of society strongly opposes that. But does does that so that that kind of is plausible? But in the case of human extinction, there seems like there might be something wrong if there's 20% of people who don't want to go extinct and then 80% who just sort of overroll and force humanity into this state of non-existence, the oblivion. So yeah, I, the, the, you know, I do discuss this in the book, but um, I'll, there could be a whole paper or series of papers written just on this issue because it's philosophically complex. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, I have so many questions right so now. Yeah, thank uh, you. We have an in-person question for you. Please. Listening to this, I have this feeling of evolve or die. Um, and you mentioned we've only existed in the sense of deep time within like a blink. And if we were to project into the future, the opportunity lost of all the potential of what we could create needs to be factored in. But then I also think of Kenya in the past 30 years, 70% of their mammals have like their the mass of mammals has disappeared so are ethicists like yourself also considering what is the opportunity cost of other species and the way that they could have evolved because if we have a nuclear war or if we continue to pollute the planet and deplete resources what if it's also not feasible for other life other than just our own and what else could that other life become like how is that considered yeah absolutely fantastic question um so, you know, my view is that uh, the well-being of non-human critters matters. <laughs> and that really should be uh, a significant variable in the equation uh, according to, yeah, that, that uh, will determine our actions, <laughs> what we do, uh, what we and what we uh, assess as the best uh, situation. But a lot of people who hold these further lost views, uh, totalist utilitarianism, long-termism, and so on, that point to all of that lost potential, you know, all that that lost value if we were to go extinct. Like other creatures just aren't really uh considered all that much. Uh in fact, so in uh, a, a book that was published last year by by a philosopher named William McCaskill, who's one of the leading long-termists. Uh, it was the book is called "What We Owe the Future." He mentions at some point that um, it could be the case that our destruction of the biosphere is net positive. This is a good thing, and the reason is, he says, we should take seriously wild animal suffering. So you know, non-human creatures out there are in the you know trapped in the Darwinian theater. Uh, according to it, where the, you know, the rule is you, uh, it's the survival of the fittest. So, you know, there, there's lots of creatures that are just, you know, fighting, struggling to survive. It's the Malthusian premise of Darwin's argument for natural selection. And consequently, they suffer a lot. The fact that we have uh, 
cause so much biodiversity loss means that there's less wild animal suffering. So overall, the total amount of suffering in the world has decreased. So th this is sort of, you know, uh, an extreme response to the sort of uh, considerations that you brought up, where actually they would flip that around and say, you know, this this is a good thing that we're destroying the biosphere. But from my perspective, yeah, I really care about other creatures and I'm sort of sympathetic with uh, positions in environmental ethics that attribute intrinsic value, not just to humans, but to a broad diversity of other creatures out there, uh, other species, maybe even aspects of the abiotic environment, the, the non-living uh, environment. So yeah, I when I think about the goodness, badness, and so on of human extinction, these questions are very much on my mind. Whereas I think for a lot of further loss theorists, they either aren't or they say, ah, actually environmental destruction, it has it has an upside. I hope that makes sense. Um, yeah, it's that's terrific. Um, and that that is actually all the time we have locked away for this right now. Um, but like, what a fascinating conversation. I feel like I could talk about this for a really long time um, until I go extinct, perhaps. Um, <laughs> so uh, just what, I guess I just want to say thank you so much for doing this. Um, really appreciate it. Uh, I'm sure we'll all rush out and get your book right now. Um, so don't be surprised if you have like a huge bump in sales over the next couple of days. Um, but uh, we'd love to have you back to talk about it some other time too, I think. Yeah, this is great. Thanks so much for, for having me. E excellent questions. Uh, really appreciate it. And very nice to meet everyone. Super fun. Thank you so much. Thank you, Toronto. Thank you. Thank you.